Great. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Daniel Tubenhauer, who will tell us about tilting modules and poles. Thank you very much, Ben, for the introduction. It, it, exactly, I'm going to talk about poles, and also for the invitation, of course. It's always a pleasure to come to Eugene, this time even saving the planet, not boarding an airplane. Um, yeah, so uh, everything I'm going to talk about is, is joint work with, with Paul, who should be in the audience somewhere. And well, the whole story started a little bit like I wanted to understand those categories of tilting modules, which I'm going to recall in a, in a few slides. And well, I did so with in very early work with Henning Andersen, uh, the quantum group case. And I just thought, hmm, so characteristic P, quantum group at a relevant P, it shouldn't be too different. So let's try characteristic P. Just as a spoiler, uh, I was very naive. So characteristic P is just much, much more complicated, but also much, much more interesting compared to the quantum group with divinity. And I will make this pretty precise, uh, staying with SL2 for most of the time. So if you never heard about representation theory and characteristic P, then you're exactly in my position. I have no idea about it. So let's just start from scratch with SL2 itself. And my first slide, and I thought, at least on the first slide, right, this conference is called Clux, the quantum groups, categorification, and local bimodules. I'm going to talk about neither of them, so no categorification, no local bimodules, and also no quantum groups. But I should at least start with a little bit of quantum to make sure, right, I started this whole project thinking quantum group of relativity and characteristic P. It's basically the same. It's not, and here's the reason why. The moral, the morally speaking, the reason why. This nice folk theorem um, due to, uh, well, it's a folk theorem, but it's sometimes cont contributed to Luca. It's very old, of course, and it's just a very naive question. So I have my, let's say, quantum binomial A over B, and I'm in quantum characteristic P. That just means uh, the, the smallest number that, that my quantum number vanishes. Right? If, if Q equals one, this is just the usual character. So how on earth can I compute this honey binomial? Well, it's very nice, actually. You just express your, your two numbers, A and B. Here's A, oops, here's B. Maybe I should, A and B, and you just express them periodically. And well, you could split the binomial, the quantum binomial, into a binomial just carrying about the zeros digit in your, in your periodic expansion, and the binomial keeping track of the rest. Okay, and by the way, this is no typo. This is a quantum binomial, this is a regular binomial. And we'll see it in, in the second life in action. And kind of the whole philosophy I want to sell today is uh, only the order of vanishing of this binomial matters in characteristic P and in the quantum group case and for tilting modules and simples and everything in the representation theory of category, uh, of, uh, of um, SL2. And I kind of claim, so I wrote SL2 here, and I kind of claim that this immediately gives all those four cases, which I will, I will zoom in on the, on, the, on the first one and on the last one. And I'm kind of, well, kind of want to ex implicitly explain the other ones as well, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. So I kind of ex claim that this is enough, this, this very old theorem is enough to completely nail down the, character, uh, the, the representation theory of SL2. Okay. So before I zoom in on that, let's try to understand the theorem really on the nose. So first of all, in my characteristic P case, so Q is one and my field is a field of characteristic P. Look at this theorem, right? So you get a binomial, you split it into two binomials. You can't do anything more here. This is already kind of minimal, but you can further split this one along its digits. So in characteristic P, and that's why it's called Lukács theorem. He was really interested in, in well, he of course, he was not interested in the quantum case, just in the characteristic P case. You can compute your binomial as just the product of the binomials of the digits of your periodic expansion. Okay, so expand it periodically and just take the product of the binomials. Note, however, in, in the quantum case, you're kind of stuck, right? You can't express this any further. This is kind of re the real difference between characteristic P and the quantum group. So let's do a really on the nose example, really uh, honest example. 
So I take B equals one, for completely forget it. So I take this B is one, I don't want, I don't want to care. And I take this 1,331, which happens to be 11 cubed because I've done my homework and of course chosen this example very carefully. And okay, right, generic case, quantum group case, this mixed case, and the main beast, the, uh, the characteristic B. Okay, so generically, okay, quantum characteristic is zero, I have nothing to do, it doesn't vanish, right? Shouldn't surprise you, binomials don't, don't die in characteristic zero, right? Quantum group case, so what do you do? Well, you express it 11 articulate, but you only care about the zero digit, and this guy will vanish of one one because you get really 11 squared here, which is not zero if I'm more than C. The mixed case is kind of the mixture, so let me uh, zoom in on, on this case. In characteristic P, you just express your number P articulate and you count all zero digits that you see, and this actually vanishes of one three. And you can already really see the difference between all of those cases. So here in the generic case, which I will call generation zero, this guy will never vanish. Okay. No matter how bad it, how big my numbers get in character in this quantum group case, I, I can never have a pole of or a vanishing of order more than one. Actually, that gets completely periodic. It might flip over and flip over and flip over and flip over again. This is generation one. This is kind of a mixture, and this gets as bad as you want, right? If A gets big, it could have 504 zero digits, and this might vanish to order 504, right? And all due to this, to this uh, Knight theorem uh, due to Luca. And I claim that's exactly enough, or that's completely enough to, to understand the, uh, the representation theory of SMT. Okay, so I will zoom in uh, now in, in to characteristic P, but kind of you should think of the, the quantum group case is really a generation one, and the main beast characteristic P is infinitely more complicated than the quantum group. I started completely naively, I believe that they are almost the same, but no, 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 no. It's infinitely more complicated in a, in a really good way. And the mixed case, which I'm not going to address anyway, is kind of, kind of infinity minus one, if you want. It's still very complicated, but not as complicated as the main beast. It's just a pain to write down, so I don't need it. Okay, such as we are all on the same page, I want to recall the vial modules. And they really go back to vial. And then, um, they're very easy for SL2, right? They're just, uh, well, you have the zero dimensional one, you have the one, dim uh, the one dimensional one, you have the two dimensional one, the three dimensional one, and so on. And they arrange themselves so nicely in this, um, in this Pascal triangle. And the action is, I mean, this is the symmetric powers, right? So the action matrix is of, of my SL2 matrix here, A, B, C, D, is just the column expansion of the corresponding uh, uh, two polynomials here in my, in, my, in my variables X and Y, okay? And you will see something funny here. So the real interesting number will be this V and not the highest weight. The highest weight is V minus one, but the interesting number is V. I don't want to call it the dimension because the generalization is that I should take my highest weight plus rho. In this case, it happens to be the dimension, but in general, it's, it's, it's the highest weight plus rho. That's the important number. In this case, just V instead of V minus one. So for, for the zero module, uh, for the trivial module, the number one is the important one, not the number zero and so on. You will see in the second one. Um, so the example, uh, this, Delta uh, zero minus one, you just expand. So this matrix acts by expanding the, uh, uh, the columns of the matrix according to this rule. And of course you see binomials. I mean, this is a binomial coefficient, right? And the funny thing that then happens is you just use this Luca theorem. And I, I don't really tell you why, but really you should look at the action of this funny matrix, which isn't an, an SO2 matrix at all. But it happens to be the important matrix, it's sometimes called the total matrix. And you just check what happens. And uh, okay, you get a lot of bunch of numbers, all those binomials. And of course, there are no zeros. So this guy actually is, is, is a simple module of the characters. So all of the characters are zero. All of these are the simple modules, the symmetric powers in characters is zero. In characteristic five, well, you can already see it, right? 15, 20, 15, all of these die, and you have found a submodule actually. So in characteristic five, 
this guy uh, turns out to be not simple. And of course, this generalizes in the following way. It's pretty nice. Uh, a well-known theorem, I think, is due to Janssen. Um, this guy is simple if and only if the binomial doesn't vanish for all w smaller than v. And if you, I, you can use, uh, let's say, you address this p, then by Lucas theorem, this almost never happens. Namely, only if v is a prime power. Um, in characteristic zero, of course, this will always be true, so they're always simple. Okay, so these are the vinyl modules. And below here, you see uh, one of those boxes that will appear several times. That's kind of the general statement here. I'm giving you an, uh, an overview of SL2, but there's a, a lot of things that actually generalize. You don't need to read all of this. For instance, well, okay, there's a vinyl module, there's a dual vinyl module. I won't be too careful to distinguish them. What is the point about vinyl modules in general? Well, they are defined integrally. They are always defined integrally. They, are, they don't depend on the characteristic. They depend on the characteristic or your root of unity or whatever, only in the sense that they will split further into, into uh, smaller symbols. But as a module, they are always defined integrally. They always exist and they have the classical characters given by Weil's character formula. That's why they are called Weil modules. And you actually, uh, there is really, a, in, in Janssen's thesis, there's actually a criterion in general for your favorite Lie, uh, Lie, Lie group, semi-simple Lie group, um, whatever, type B405. You will find some root theoretical with criterion which has those binomials uh, as well to, to check whether this is simple. This is just really a, a tiny case of a more general stuff. Anyway, we don't need to remember that. You only need to remember this statement. Um, whether it's simple only depends uh, on by Lucas theorem. Only uh, by Lucas theorem is, is if and only if it's prime power, and it really depends on the vanishing of this coefficient. Okay, I, sh I have a link here. I don't want to click on it. I want you to click on it, so you can click on it later. The slides are online, I hope, uh, on the on the on the Quax web page or also on my web page. Because now you can you can do actually better than this. You can you can play this this theorem to actually pick out exactly the symbols. But I want to do the opposite. I want to go to the tilting models and show you the game for the tilting models, which is which is also very nice. Okay, so up to this point, I had those those vial modules and they are very nice. What what, what makes them so nice is that they are defined integral, right? Exists in any characteristic, are independent basically of the characteristic. And I want to kind of find the symbols. Well, in the branch of categorification, I grew up actually in abelian categories, not so nice, and in additive categories, very nice. So instead of looking at the symbols, I should actually look at some interposable modules. And the tilting modules, in particular, the way I will I define them here, I will comment on that in a second. You should think of them if you like finite dimensional algebra as kind of the uh, it's the equivalent of projective indecomposables, right? You have symbols, you have projective indecomposables, and it's not quite clear which one should play the, the role of the elements in your story. These are symbols when you like, when you like abelian categories or projective indecomposables, if you like additive categories, and these are more like the additive version. In particular, here's my definition. My, uh, well, it's, it's maybe not the definition you have seen in general. Here's again the general box. You can see it here. Um, so the general definition. I just define them as to be the indecomposable tilting modules, or the tilting modules in general, then, are just the indecomposable summons of the tensor product, and this is just the vector representation, right? So delta one is just the vector representation itself, the two-dimensional representation. And that's what I want to call a tilting model. Tilting modules are the indecomposable summons of something very nice, like the projective indecomposables are indecomposable summons of something very nice. Okay, and it turns out that they behave kind of kind of in the opposite way than the symbols. Um, for instance, they are again parametrized by domain by, by domain integral rates. The F is nice reciprocity, they really behave in the uh, in the opposite way as the symbols. The the delta factor will appear in T as often as whatever the, the, the symbol will appear in in the corresponding uh, nabla or, or delta. So I, as I said, I do, don't worry about deltas or nablas. They have dual so vial modules and dual vial modules. They're not really different. I, I, I will treat them equally. 
In particular, because I will go to characteristic zero in a second. And then they are just the same. And in general, they are different. Anyway. And what makes it so interesting, so the fact that you have three natural bases of the Grodin group uh, of, 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 the, of, of, the, of the representation categories, and they are all unitriangular with respect to each other. You have a basis of simples, you have the basis of uh, bimodules or dual bimodules, and you have the basis of tilting models. Each one of them is really like with uh, simples and projectors, and let's say you have a nice finite dimensional algebra where you have some much more standard modules sitting in between. It's really exactly the same. Um, and I mean, this looks exactly like, like the slide here, and it's really almost the same. And what I want to describe is the scattery tilt by generating relations. That's what I'm up for. Because I think, okay, these are my projective inequalposables in, uh, uh, in, for finite dimensional algebra. So why not give it a shot to describe it by generating relations? And you will see in a second, uh, actually, why this is an interesting question if you're not already going. Let me just zoom in into my strategy before I, before I continue. Um, so these tilting modules actually, they want to be characteristic zero things, right? So in particular, they have this nice hot formula. You don't have to look at it too much. I will just click on the link in a second because they satisfy a version of source limit. Where you can de determine the, the, the dimension of the home spaces uh, also between two tilting modules by just looking at their Nabla factors or the delta. And why do I call this Schur's lemma? Well, so here's my, my philosophy how I want to think about this starting modules. They are the indecomposable summons of the stencil product. And all you know in characteristic zero, well, the indecomposable summons of the stencil product is semi simple, will be the simple, they will be those bio models. Okay, so in characteristic zero, there will be zillions of those idempotents splitting off those bio models. Very nice. In characteristic P, you will realize that those idempotents are not really idempotents anymore because they're not well defined because they have poles in their expressions. Said so otherwise, uh, if you work over Z and you uh, just multiply with the corresponding eigenvalue of your, of your idempotent, you get a pseudo idempotent. And this pseudo idempotent, you can either rescale it if you're in characteristic zero because everything's nice and you just divide by your numbers, or it will die, it get nil potent because you say you're something, something divisible by P term. But still, you have this nice home problem. And I kind of want to use, play the following game. I just assume that I know my character of my tilting module in the row. I know that it will look something like this. It will, there will be a base change matrix between my tilting module and my delta module. So my delta modules are the integral modules. They are nice, they are characteristic zero, they are in characteristic zero, they are simple, and so on. They are well-known, symmetric powers, very nice. And I just pretend, I, I define tilting module T bar, and I just pretend it's a characteristic zero. So I just take the direct sum of the corresponding uh, modules starting up. And this really is a philosophy I want to do here. I never want to go to characteristic P, or at, at least not as long as I can, right? Because characteristic P is really complicated. Okay. And I, I'm not doing anything complicated. So just don't do it. Just pretend you're in characteristic zero. And then it actually turns out, so that's why I call the Schuss lemma, that the dimension, for, for example, the dimension of the, the one I'm interested in, the tilting module in characteristic P, is actually the dimension of my funny tilting module in characteristic zero, which of course is just a direct sum of simple modules. So this is just by Schuss lemma, you can just, well, you get one here and those guys square. Right? So this is really Schuss lemma. And if you, if you look back on this formula, that's exactly the formula, just that you have to be careful to distinguish delta and number one. That's the only thing. Right. So I call this vial clustering. So what's going on? Okay, I have my vial factors. They sit in my tensor product no matter what. You can't get rid of them. They're integral. You, they, oh, they're always there. Okay. In characteristic zero, they it is split off. They will be the simples. In characteristic P, they cluster together and form those funny tilting modules. So each tilting module is actually built out like this one, oops, like this one, built out of, of those nabla factors, and they just split off in characteristic P because you have those either potents which have poles, but they don't in characteristic. Uh, sorry, the other way, they split off in characteristic zero, but they don't in characteristic. However, those tilting modules are built such that my strategy will work. You will see, I will, I will do a lot of calculations, which are completely bonkers. I will divide by zero all the time, and I still get the correct result. 
You will see it. It will be fun. Um, I, I can just pretend I'm in characteristic zero and I still get the correct results, right? So those two end spaces are completely different. This is just a matrix algebra and this is the one I want to compute. But I still want to do computations here and then play some trick to pull everything over. At the very end, I want to pull everything over and I get, I, I, I get a generator and relation presentation of this end space here for any lambda, for any home space, you know. Yeah. This kind of the kind of- What's structure. MDG in that sum? Um, in, the, in the picture that pops up. What's MDG, there's a direct sum over MDG. I will explain it in a second. I will explain it in a second. Okay. So what I haven't explained, so what, what Ben was basically asking is uh, how to determine those guys here, which, because I want to have this module. And this is NDG, I will explain it now. Okay, but this is the strategy. Never go to characteristic P, that's way too hard. Just stay in characteristic zero as long as you can, because tilting modules are built such that they work in characteristic zero. Okay, and because they are built out, out of those nice modules, uh, those, those, those integral modules. So here comes uh, the question Ben was asking. Of course, there should be a way to determine just using vanishing of binomials to determine the, the vial factors that turn up because um, those are really the, 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 the poles that you see in those item poles. I will come back to this in a second. And that's what I will call NDG in a second. So for instance, I want to compute the number of vial factors of my TV and I only need to take the maximum vanishing order of my quantum binomials, right? So here's an explicit example. Probably the biggest number, no, this, is, this huge is the biggest number I ever used in a talk, but anyway, so what do you do? You take the number V, whatever it is. You should look at this expression. It's, it's horrible anyway. You should look at this expression, the periodic extension, right? So you see one, two, three, four non-zero digits. So we will have two to the four uh, vial factors turning. You can check that the maximal vanishing actually appears for this guy, and you can check that this guy has is divisible by order four. Okay. So vanishing the poles, the zeros, or the, the divisibility by p of the of the of the binomial. It's that looks like five right there. And no, this is not zero. Oh, this oh, sorry. Four. Yeah, sorry. I, I don't have any good expression for it, but this is non-zero here. Yeah, this one. Okay. And this is this NDG is a negative digit game. I can actually use exactly the same strategy to uh, figure out what kind of vial factors I have. So I'm using here my strategy and just, just write it down. And the vial factors that appear are exactly the in, inverting the non zero digits. For instance, this one will appear. And let me make this ex, 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 uh, completely precise. So here, this is exactly the same example, right? 200 whatever. And you, you would just take those digits and you invert one at a time and just have 16 of them and those would be, would be the corresponding vial factors. Of course, you don't want to think of this in terms of those numbers, you want to think of them, oops, in terms of those inverted scalars. Okay, so very easy. And this, so I can write down the character in this case very easily by just periodically expanding everything in invert scalars. Um, a comment for the expert, if you think now of the quantum group, you would play the same game. It's exactly the same game, but you only care for the last digit. In particular, your vial factors, in this case, of course, your vial factors, uh, your uh, tilting modules can have as many vial factors as you want, right? Two to the K for some K. In the quantum group case, K is at most one. So either you are either R simple or you have two bar factors, right? Why? Because you would only care about the zero digit because of the vanishing of the quantum uh, binomial by, by Lukács here. Okay, it's almost time for a break. Perfect. So this is my my uh, strategical interlude, my slide for the break. So what? I, so here we are. We start knowing nothing. I want to define. I will. I will. You can already see the links. I will define. On, I want to define a category given by generators and relations, which in, end, in the end will turn out to be integrally equivalent to some category generated by, uh, by, those, uh, by those integral modules, by those vial modules. 
And I want to find certain bases of this. I will zoom in in a second, of course. And the main players will be the static bases and the standard bases. And I want to compute the base change matrix and everything in green is still not doing anything in characteristic P. And then I have to go to characteristic P and I have to make sure that my poles actually don't exist. Right? I got rid of all the poles. Uh, and I don't know how to, well, we will see. I will see in a second. And I think in the end, what drops out will be the quiver. And I will explain the quiver as well as the way to actually get the quiver. And I think that's a good point for, for a break. All right, we'll break until 30 and uh, ask questions. Yeah, I, I guess my question is um, looking at the strategy page. So yeah. um, it seems like part of this strategy is already knowing what the character of the tilting module is. You're a little bit ahead of everyone here, or at least ahead of me. Um, I have my, my thing. I need to know what the tilting character is. That's exactly correct. Right. That's what I want to get rid of. I think there should be um, a purely diagrammatic way, we'll see it in a second, to not having to do this. But at the moment, I have to rely on knowing what the tilting characters are. And that's, of course, a huge problem because from SS3 onwards, I just don't know what they are. Right? But I'm, I'm hoping to kind of have, in the future, I would have a, a strategy which avoids this. Okay. So here, the only thing that is known from SN3 onwards are actually the tilting characters for generation one, which is a quantum pole. And mm -hmm. for generation two, there are some, some conjectures, but that's basically it. So Ben is completely correct. My strategy fails in this red box for now. So if anyone knows a nice answer, you will see it in a second. How to get rid of my assumption that I know the tilting characters, I would be happy to hear it. I mean, in particular, right, like, I mean, the rank of this matrix reduced mod P, I mean, this is, you know, right, that, right. that's, this is like, you know, goes back to Janssen, and like, the yeah. whole problem for people is they couldn't calculate the rank of that matrix. Right, that's, it's hard, I, I know, I know, I mean, there's a reason why character CP is so hard. But so you're saying you're hoping there's a diagrammatic way of doing it. Is right, that yes. going to hide again what the what the demand, what the characters are? Right. I mean, this is one of these things that I I feel like is is kind of one of these iron right. laws. So, um, right. Where if you have a multiplicity that okay. well, you need to like do you can... Kajdan listing to compute, then like either you can get a nice description of things that hides what the multiplicities are, and you don't know what the dimensions of the simples are. Or if you try to do some formulation where you know what the dimensions of the simples are, then you get a huge mess because like, it's hard. Right. But no, I mean, the point is, um, in everything I'm going to do, I never use anything like, like the Frobenius twist, for instance. So there might be a, a, a different strategy somewhere, and there might be a completely diagrammatic argument to just avoid knowing the different characters. But for now, I just don't know any. That's, that's just how it is. And that's why I call this my original set. This is where everything kind of depends on something I don't want it to depend on. Yeah, life is tough sometimes. Um, I had a, sorry, it's a little noisy in the background here. This is Monica. I had a question from one of your very early slides when you had the examples with P equals 11 and uh, you had yeah, written sure. this, you know, Q car equals 10 and we weren't sure if it was a typo or oh, whatever. Okay. Somewhere oh, okay. So, so then there, this slide. Yeah, on the third line when you have if K is F11 bar and Q is 2 and then is two know. in characteristic 11 is a 10th root of unity. So the quantum characteristic is actually 10. Okay, so some people had suggested that. Okay. If I have done my homework correctly, of course.
Any more questions before we start again? Then let's start again. Okay, so thank you very much for, <laughs> for, for the questions of us. Um, okay, so let me go to this category. I'm pretty sure most of you know it, but let, let's just do it. So um, the historically wrong name for this category is temporary leap category. The historically correct name for this category is rumor teller bile category. In order to not confuse anyone, I decided to call it web because of course there is a, a more general approach using, using webs, which we have seen uh, in actually the first talk today. So anyway, it's pretty simple in this case, and it's just a monoidal category, Z, uh, uh, Z linear, and it's generated by just one stupid object. And there are just two morphisms, which are called cup and cap, and they are called score evaluation and devaluation. And all of you have seen those relations before. In particular, up to, ah, there might be something strange going on in characteristic two. This looks very nice. Okay. Um, okay, so this is my category. I want just to, to do the temporal leap category, or how I would call it, web. Okay, and if you have never seen this category before, here are some examples. Uh, so this crossing, the, the Kaufmann bracket formula is actually really already in this paper, right? And the paper actually, you will see it, you will see it again. So the right, correct name of the category should be actually rheumatic. Anyway, so if you had raw crossings, then here are some examples. I could stack this on top of what, wait, this one on top of this one, and I would get a picture like this, and I would get a minus two here by just moving that circle. And of course, this has generalized uh, quite a bit. And if I don't want to do characteristic P, but let's say it's a quantum group, then I, I think what I'm going to, to say generalizes um, to, to, to at least type A. Because in type A, I would know, coming back to Ben's question, I, in type A, I actually know the, uh, the, the, the tilting characters for the quantum group, which are given by certain personality quantum. Okay, so temporally deep or web or whatever you want to call it. And now I want to find this, those bases. And I claim this is all the same. They all work in the same way. I want to find it, I mean, it's an integral category. I should find integral bases. Um, and I want to find a standard basis and I want to find a tilting basis. Before I do, well, let's do it. Let's just do it. And this also goes back to Ruba Tellavile, but I actually learned it from a paper of Ben, which, which, uh, in, in which he does the, the general SLN case. It's, it's, a, it's a very general strategy. It works as follows, right? We're doing characteristic P without doing characteristic P. We'll see that in a second. So my completely generic, oops, my completely generic SL, uh, SL2 fusion rules, all of you have seen this before, like multiplication by, by one. And this corresponds to two directions in my SL2 weight letters, right? SL2 weight letters is a bit boring, it's just a line. But I have two directions, and I have two natural maps I associate to each direction. And for each, formally speaking, for each path in my dominant vial chamber, I'll resume in an example in a second, I would, would define a certain web, a certain diagram inductively by, well, whenever I see this direction, I just put a strand next to it. Whenever I see this direction, I cut off the last strand I see. And this inductively builds me an element, which uh, I then stick together to get the usual crossing as matching basis, um, as explained a long time ago by those guys, and by Ben in more generality. And this is how it works, really, in this case. So what is the dominant vial chamber for SL2? It's just a positive natural numbers. And here would be a legal path, right? I go plus, plus, minus, plus. And I stay always in my positive vial chamber, or I go minus plus. This is a non example, but I leave my positive vial chamber. So I only take those guys. And let's say, then what, what do you do in order to calculate this basis? You just list all of them. So I've listed all, all of length, uh, what is it, four, four boundary points. You can write down the corresponding, using exactly the strategy, write down the corresponding basis elements. Like, okay, plus uh, the one, 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 one. So the plus, 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 just four strands. What is this one, for instance? This one, the two, well, it's here. And you put a strand, and now you see a minus, you cover it off, you put a strand, you put a strand. 
Let's do this one. You put a strand, you put a strand, you put a strand, you cut it off. Right? This one, you put a strand, you put a strand, you cut off the strand, you cut off the strand. This is how you work the base. And then you stick them together using the usual strategy that this is kind of the, the, the lower part of the diagram. These are all basis elements, and they should look very familiar. These are the crossing and symmetric basis of the temporary leap algebra, just explained in a nice way, right? Just explained in a way where you think, oh yeah, I can generalize to my favorite type B hundred and B B four five hundred and four as long as I have some reasonable right calculus, which is still missing, by the way. Um, so Ben explains how to generalize this to S like. Okay. Okay, so this is a nice basis, integral basis. You never see any coefficients turning up, right? I start with identity, I put a strand or a cup it off. Put a strand, cup it off, put a strand, cup it off. You never see that. Uh, you never see any funny coefficients. Okay, and now I want to play the same game. It's exactly the same game. So what is happening here? Well, kind of, you can see it here, kind of, kind of, kind of, wherever you go, it, it tells you the highest weight space your morphism will factor. Okay, I'm going through a certain weight space, but maybe I don't want to just randomly go through this weight space, but I rather want to pick out my, my, my wild factor, uh, my indecomposable, my, my simple wild factor. Remember, we are still in characteristic zero. Right? So what I do, well, it's exactly the same rule, but every time I use a projector. Okay, this projector, if you've never seen it, doesn't matter, there's a projector to the, to the, to the highest summit, in the corresponding corresponding weight space, it's called the Jones Central projector, um, and you just plot it in every time you do this. And note that the only thing you, you need to know about those projectors, they have funny coefficients turning up. In particular, they have coefficients that are really almost always divisible by p. So this basis is really a basis, as it should, as you see in a second, is really a basis that only makes sense in characteristic zero. But anyway, the diagrams look exactly the same. You just stick it in each step, you stick in a projector. That's the only difference. All right, so integral basis defined using the fusion rule. This funny basis having the projectors defined using the fusion rule. And you would guess, okay, maybe we can play the same game. Again, I need to know the 30 characters at the moment to play this game. But anyway, you can write down this tilting projector this projects to my T bar. And you just stick it in, in, this, in the, exactly the same way, completely inductively. So let me uh, show you actually how those guys look like. So here, this is one of those projectors. So what is going on here? So um, I don't worry about these coefficients too much. You can write them down explicitly. So each one of those funny boxes here is a Jones Wenzel projector. So we have a lot of them, and all of them have poles. Almost all of them have poles, so it doesn't really make sense to write this down in characteristic P. And then I take a certain sum of them. Okay, why do I want to do that? Let, let us think about it. Okay, I know that this is my tilting, so this is T bar for the corresponding V. And well, Remember my ne negative digit game. So this one will factor. So this here you see the vial, one of the wild factors in this expression. Here you see the top wild factor. Here's another wild factor. Here's another wild factor. So I just sum right, in characteristic zero. This splits off. This idempotent splits off. One of the wild factors. This idempotent splits off. The other wild factor, and so on and so on. They don't make sense in characteristic zero uh, in characteristic p, but their sum is well defined in characteristic p, which is very, which is a lot of fun. So each term uh, separately contains zillions of poles. And here you actually see more poles, right? The zero's digit is already uh, a zero here, which means it's divisible by P. You have poles, 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 poles all over the place. You take a sum and this guy would be well-defined. And in order to show that this is well-defined, I need to know the tilting characters. But I think you should be able to show that they are, come back to Ben's question, that they are well-defined, not knowing the tilting characters, which is, an, 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 very hard exercise. I don't know how to do it in, in uh, resource Jones Venture projectors in, in diagrammatic class. But anyway, the strategy is still the same. I'm in characteristic zero. I sum up my projectors, which are totally fine in characteristic zero, which are horrible, not well defined in characteristic P. I get something well defined and I'm happy. 
that claim that's that's correct. I can still stay in characteristic zero, and all of them are basically orthogonal lightipotents, and I can can continue my my calculation. So, all right. All right. So this is how those projectors are built. Just notice there's almost no difference. They're all built using SN2, uh, using fusion roots, using something semi-simple, and just stick in the projector, which makes this not not defined in characteristic B, uh, characteristic B, and this one will be well defined. By definition, these will split off the tilting modules, the T bars. This will split off the vial modules, the, the deltas, and this is just an integral basis, which kind of goes through the corresponding mass space. Okay, so this is a very general procedure, right? You only need to know those highest weight projectors and you stick it in according to the according to the fusion rules. And so let me explain why I'm so much interested in this in those two bases. So this is my sun, which is what I call the basis S, the standard basis. This is basis I call T. Uh, tilting bases. So why I'm so interested? Okay, they all give bases of the same home spaces, right? That's how they are constructed. I'm still working over in characteristic zero. Um, this one is nice. You will see it in a second. You needed to prove that you are not completely going crazy, but otherwise it's it's what it is. Okay, and they're all constructed by this bottleneck principle, which I light leaf, light letters bases, light leaf bases. Always it's always kind of the same structure. Cellular basis, whatever you want. Um, but let's focus on those two. So the standard basis. Why am I so interested in this? Well, this is the basis that splits off the delta factors, the simple factors from the tensor product. This is the artin Wedderburn basis, right? So all of those basis elements, what kind of relations do they satisfy? They satisfy a completely trivial relation. They're orthogonal idempotents. So anyone can calculate. That's what you expect. It's semi-simple category. Anyone can calculate a, a representative algebra here, but it should be something extremely trivial. And this is the one I want. I claim this is the one I want. And if I know the base change matrix between the two, well, and I could express those guys in terms of the easy ones, do some calculations here and pull the relations back. Here it's well defined, here it's crazy, here it's well defined. So I'm starting at A, doing something extremely crazy, divide by zero all the time in the middle. Come back to B, here's B, so A, whoop, doing something crazy. Coming back to B, everything is well defined. I claim that's the right result. Okay. This is kind of an Euler type calculation, right? So just shut up and calculate and worry about details later. This is really how it works. This is really how you should work with this with tilting modules. It's kind of they are built such that this works. Okay, let me do an extremely explicit example. You don't need to look too much about on the details here, but just to show you that my calculations are completely bonkers, they're completely nonsense. Let's get the correct result. Okay, I take my my T bar here, just two digits, and according to the negative digit game, I would have two factors here. Those are the two. Um, you shouldn't express those numbers, you, you can try it, right? I mean, this is just 11 plus one, so it should be uh, 12, and this is just 11 minus one, so it should be. Uh, uh, 10, I guess. Anyway, just look at the digits. Okay, so I get those this basis. I explained how this works. There's two basis elements, of, of course. So I'm just uh, looking for the end space here right now, right? So just end of this tilting one. Okay, it has two summons, so it should, <laughs> it should have been two dimensional and semi simple. And these are just orthogonal items, pretty trivial. And I have this basis B, uh, T, and I, I wonder what kind of relation does it satisfy? Okay, and I need to compute this base change matrix. Which isn't all that hard. It's it's not trivial, but it isn't all that hard. From T to S, and I claim it looks like this. Note the interesting thing. We have some some kappa, whatever. Here is something that is ten over eleven, or the inverse then has eleven over ten. So this is a completely nonsense calculation in characteristic B. Either I have a matrix that is not defined, or even not defined, or I have a matrix that is certainly not invertible. So either I have a zero here, or I have an even worse a, a pole with ten over eleven. I don't care. I just go on. Okay? I just go on. And I express, let's say, this matrix just says that this element is just a scalar multiple of this one. Okay? So this one is an idempotent, so it squares to one. So what does this element do? Well, it squares to exactly the scalar multiple times, times the other element, but the scalar multiple turns out to be, that's how it's built. 
11 over 10. So, so this is, by the way, well defined in characteristic P, but it's zero in characteristic P. So um, in characteristic zero, it's just a stupid base change, but in characteristic P, now things will die. And you will see, well, if you do your calculation carefully, you will see actually the end spaces now in characteristic P. So K is my characteristic P field, isomorphic to the cohomology ring of the black variety of SN2, or in less fancy words, it's just Kx mod x squared. Let me stress again that the calculation was completely nonsense, but you get the correct result. So this is how you should, should work with Tokyo, right? So the base change matrix doesn't make any sense. In characteristic P, but not in characteristic P. So fantastic. That's why I'm interested in this base change matrix. This is the basis I want because I want to calculate the end spaces or the home spaces between tilting modules. A base change to something that is almost trivial because it's the Eichel basis. And I get my, all my relations, all the relations that I want. Okay, so let me finish to show you. Well, okay, then there is this original sin which makes sure that all poles. Are not there anymore. So expression A is well defined, expression B is well defined. It doesn't matter what I do in the middle. And then actually I can reduce mod P and I get the curve I want. And let me show it to you because it's extremely beautiful. Maybe you can already guess um, if, if you keep on my, my if you keep in mind that I have this, this game of digits, that it should be something fractal. And we'll see it in a second. It is actually really something fractal. Okay, so here's the result. Uh, what do I mean by I give a generator's relations presentation? Well, I want to have such a factor F to some projective modules over some quiver algebra, and the quiver is basically generating the relation there, so explicitly. And it should identify any possible tilting modules with any composable projectives. And this is how the quiver looks like. Uh, I will zoom in in a second. So it has the vertices that corresponding to my V. Of course, they're infinitely many. This is characteristic three there will be the corresponding tilting module and decide its vial factors. So this tilting module has whatever, those vial factors. Yeah. So the end space here would be uh, uh, eight dimensional. Right. Um, here it would be here. So everything in red, those are the ones that are uh, semi-simple. So where the T is the nabla when it is simple and it gets sparser and sparser and sparser. These are only, only multiples of prime powers by Lucas theorem. Otherwise, it looks like this. Um, what are the relations? Is now the question. So this, I, I think, this is pretty nice. Um, you will see in a second why this is completely fractal. So let me zoom in a little bit. Right, characteristic zero. Uh, so generation zero, generation one, generation two, and then generation infinity. So in generation one, which I mean by you never go across this line here. Right. You see, you have just three vertices and there's no connection, right? I cut it off here. And of course, that's how it should be. Generation one, uh, generation zero is nothing vanishes. Everything is well defined. You have something semi simple. The curve should be completely boring. It should be just vertices. And if you, of course, continue this periodically, you get the curve in characteristic zero. That's exactly characteristic zero, right? It's generation zero. This is semi simple, as I said. The curve has to be boring almost by definition. Now, I don't know by definition, but it has to be boring. Anyway, um, generation one. Generation one, I would go to, here's my first, my first, uh, so here, this one shifted by one. Here's my, my first vanishing of order two, of order two. Uh, no, here it is. And I, I cut it off here. So this would be generation one. So you would already see it's not semi-simple. This one is connected to this one is connected to this one, for example. Uh, two is connected to four, is connected to eight, it's connected to 10 and so on. So you have connected components, but they're certainly not trivial. And this is a, the, so this is a zero digit game, right? Generation one. So this is, root, uh, if you continue this periodically, you get um, the quantum group. The quantum group has a complex supermodality. And each connected component is a zigzag algebra. The zigzag algebra, Josh will talk about zigzag algebra in a second or in the next, next talk. Um, if you've never seen zigzag algebra, it's pretty easy. Going two steps in one direction is zero, um, and you have the zigzag relation. If you, if you do a loop here or do a loop here, it's, it's, it's just the same. So, well, I can also say in this case, it's zero dimensional and I have a zigzag algebra in each direction I see. I just have not any, any interesting directions. 
And here I have a zigzag algebra in my one direction, generation one, so it's dimension one. In generation two, so I would cut it off somewhere, somewhere here where I see the first crazy guy of, of a bigger length. Um, now I have a zigzag algebra in, in each direction of my, of my potential digits. So they arrange themselves in a grid. And it's really just each, 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 each column, each, each, each row is a zigzag algebra and you basically have a square root relation. So the, the actual relation to it. But the point is in each uh, dimension, which I would like to think about uh, as being the potential zero digits in your, uh, so the potential uh, poles in your expressions in your, in your, in your, uh, in your periodic expansion, in each direction of the zigzag algebra. And this just continues. There are, there are some scalars and error terms which you probably can scale out. I never bothered about it. But this basically continues. And you just think about this quiver as being kind of an infinite grid of zigzag algebras all glued uh, in, in infinite directions together. And, and you have some squares commute relations. So it's really infinitely more complicated in the good sense that, than, the, than the good old quantum group itself, as it should be, right? The, the binomial just vanishes of arbitrary high order. So this is, very, so this is a, a very nice fractal quiver. Okay, um, I can stop here or I just continue for the next four minutes to show you work in progress because I really claim up to my original sin, this completely generalizes. So here you have some nice zigzag algebras glued uh, according to the digits into one another and Something similar will happen in characters A in, for SL3 or whatever. So let's do SL3. Let's just, let's just try to do it. Sorry. Uh, same strategy. I would do the same strategy. I would have to make sure that there are no poles. So exactly the same problem. But I would do exactly the same strategy and almost nothing changes. Okay. My web category looks a bit more complicated. You have seen those web categories uh, for SLN actually, or for GLN in, in Lulu's talk and in, in Manuel's talk, but it's kind of the same idea. You take the fusion rules, you have one direction for everything, you can write down, now it's really due to Ben, you can write down an, an integral basis according to the fusion rules, you can write down uh, 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 a standard basis, but just, oh, I, I forgot to put the projectors here, but just putting the projectors everywhere, so it should be projectors, and you should be projectors as well, you can define a uh, a tilting basis, and you stick them all together to get to get exactly the same pattern. And then you want to want to compute the base change. Here's an example: so standard basis, no projectors, tilting basis. You stick in projectors. Uh, uh, sorry, standard basis. You stick in projectors. Arti Vanderburg basis, tilting basis. You stick in the tilting projectors, and you want to compute um, the base change matrix between the two, and you get a quiver for S and three. And just to give you a hint, so this is usually how those, um, like you take paths in the, in the positive vibe cone, they will look like this. For instance, here's another, here are three paths, here are zillions of paths, and the red paths are not allowed because they leave the positive vibe cone. And you take all those paths and you build all these projectors. And then you compute those base change matrices and you're done. And so this is basically how the, how the tilting characters uh, look like for SL3, right? You have this, this nice folding pattern. So the tilting module which sits here for SL3 somewhere has all those vial factors in, 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 it, in the expression. So it would take uh, the corresponding projectors and just sum them all up and you get a well-defined projector projecting to the tilt. Okay, and I think I'm basically out of time. Thank you. Daniel, are there questions? So, so if you know the tilting characters, you basically get for free that this this linear combination is going yes. to have no poles. Yes, it's it, it's basically an argument that you go to something like QP, and in QP you only have to make sure that you end up in ZP, which you can specialize to characteristic zero or to characteristic P. It's an unimportant lifting argument. That's yes, I, I, I agree.
Hi, Daniel. Great talk. Hi. I, I have a question. Who is talking? Sorry. Uh, Elijah. Ah. Um, I guess the first, I have a couple questions. Maybe the first one I'll ask is you said that this should work for like classical types, but why, why wouldn't yes, your approach? I, mean, I, I think I can just copy Ben's strategy of, I mean, little bit pass and this, this whole strategy should work for all types. Yes. I guess the web practice. Certainly. But I guess why wouldn't it work in like uh, F4? Or, or whatever. Um, I wouldn't call F4 classical type. Uh, Oh, okay. um, the problem is the way I want to think about tilting modules is they are direct summons of tensor product of a vector representation. I don't mm -hmm. know what the vector representation where F4 is supposed to be. Right? You would, in principle, it would work for F4 as well. I just sure. don't want to think about F4. Okay. Um, so the other question that I had was um, about the scalars that you said are in your SL2 quiver. Mm -hmm. Um, if you studied those scalars more closely, would you be able to understand the mixed characteristic case? Yes, I think so. I, I think the mixed characteristic is just a matter of, of bookkeeping. It, it, it will get, it should be a little bit easier. It should be infinity minus one, but it will get kind of tricky to write it down because you have quantum numbers and you have usual numbers. And, uh, so I, I just don't, I think it should be doable. I think it's interesting to do it, but it, yeah. I just, we never did it. That's I see. Just, so, the, but the scalars aren't in, so the scalars are not written. Um, the, the scale, all those scalars are written explicitly in our paper. So, yeah. Uh, the application just hasn't been done. They're actually very nice functions that turn up in, in number theory, like, like whatever, I forgot, but they're not too, too complicated. Okay. And then my last question, sorry. I mean, nobody ever asks questions at these things, so I'll just ask another one. Um, it, you express the P Jones Wenzels in terms of the characteristic zero Jones Wenzels, like yeah. here. If I, instead of the characteristic zero Jones Wenzels, I used the, the quantum group Jones Wenzels at a pth root of unity. Yes. I that, could, should also work. That, 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 should, should al that should also work, but are, are the formula the, the formulas become somewhat nicer in some cases? Like they would just be it would just be one thing equals the other thing. I guess what I'm asking is is there a way to maybe make this manifestly positive by oh. uh, using Q No. So the only thing I can I mean, I, I never tried to express a P Jones Wenzel in terms of the quantum group Jones Wenzels. But it, the only thing I can guarantee that it really uh, cuts the expression in half, right? Because I'm, now I'm using characters, uh, so generation whatever, and I express it in, in terms of generation zero, and I would just go one generation higher. But I don't know anything about positive. I, I, I never tried. So, I mean, I have maybe a, a slightly more general question, which is like, Go ahead. I mean, this approach of understanding, uh, you know, these, these tilting modules by looking at these tensor powers, I mean, it's a very well established approach. Like, there's the whole theory of Schur algebras. So, like, somehow, what are, what are you going to learn that people weren't able to figure out by thinking about sure algebras for a few decades, right? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I mean, they know cellular bases for the sure algebras. So like... Well, I'm, I'm not saying that the bases I wrote down are new, right? I mean, they're uh, basically been... <laughs> it's a different basis than the sure algebras. Mm -hmm. It's a basis that's adapted to the noidal structure, which the Schur algebra one isn't. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for example. Oh yeah, I haven't talked about the noidal structure at all. Okay, so that's another open question to give not just a presentation uh, as a, as a category, but as a noidal category. So decompose tensor products of, of of those funny projectors. Okay. Um, and yeah, it's a very different thing than the Schur algebra. All right. Uh, it, it's just like a, a very different 
I mean, you know, when you have a cellular algebra, you get a million other cellular algebras by any upper triangular change of basis. Sure. I showed you three, actually, yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, um, and then they're not all guaranteed to get, be the same integrally in some sense. Like they can give you different integral forms of the category. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, right. I mean, again, as, as illustrated in the talk. Uh, yeah, I mean, similar like this BCD case, right? You have these, uh, uh, I don't know what they usually call them, like affine Brower. Type things. Do we have more questions? That was a very nice talk. Thanks, Daniel. My pleasure.